Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the matters by which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual morality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a confession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one by one kind, and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does... She should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, he should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of a circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called... There let him remain with God. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is, 
Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. The seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians opens with the Apostle Paul answering a question concerning marriage. These married Corinthian Christians were saying, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. If you're reading this out of the New King James Version, you'll see the statement as, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Touching a woman was a euphemism in Greek for sexual relations. We see in the Old Testament that touching a woman was also a Jewish euphemism for sexual relations. Think about Proverbs 6 and verse 29, Ruth 2 in verse 9, and Genesis 20 in verse 6. We can further confirm that this is the right understanding because the following verses are going to give directions concerning sexual relations. So that's why most translations take the literal wording of this euphemism. So what are we seeing are two extremes in thinking of these Christians in Corinth. In chapter 6, remember, we saw that some were saying that all things are lawful for them and the body is meant for sexual relations. Paul has condemned this thinking, teaching that any sexual conduct or contact before marriage or outside of marriage is a sin. Now we are seeing in chapter 7 the other extreme that says that some are saying that all sex relations, even in marriage, are evil. Is it good to have no sexual relations at all? This seems to be where some of these Christians are coming from in this statement that the Apostle Paul quotes. Now some translations do not have the quotation marks. The ESV version does here, as you'll notice meaning that Paul was teaching that it's good to abstain from sexual relations with a woman, I don't believe that this can be Paul's teaching at all because of Genesis chapters 1 and 2. God made them male and female, commanded them to leave father and mother and be joined together, to become one flesh, and to be fruitful and multiply. God made our bodies and declared that he is for our bodies. We saw that in our last study in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 13. Intimacy in marriage cannot be portrayed as a necessary evil. You know, that God had to give you something, some way to vent this kind of you know, sexual desire and urgency. In fact, Paul will argue the opposite in this paragraph. Intimacy is a necessary good. Verse 2, Paul must respond against the idea that it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But the way that Paul responds to this 
is interesting. He could have said that sexual relations and marriage are not sinful, but commanded in Genesis 1 verse 28, when God said, be fruitful and multiply. Paul could have used Genesis to remind his readers that God made our bodies this way. God gave us these desires, gave us these bodies for intimacy and marriage. But there's more that must be considered in this answer. And Paul uses this as an opportunity to deal with the problem of sexual morality that he discussed in the last paragraph or in the last chapter. Notice that Paul says that marriage is a solution to all the sexual immorality that is occurring. Satan is using the strong weapon of sexual morality to tempt people to sin. And I think it's important for us to recognize that verse 2 is not merely saying that because of sexual morality, you got to get married. God has a very high view of marriage, and he gives many reasons for it. We see the scripture declare that marriage is how we have the blessing of children. Genesis 1 verse 28. The place of physical intimacy. I mean, the Song of Solomon, enough said. And it's a reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, we see that in great detail. Marriage also has a value benefit of maintaining sexual purity and protecting against sexual morality. It certainly does. But verse 2 does not say that because of sexual morality, you ought to get married. Rather, it's another euphemism. Most Greek scholars note that a man having his own wife and a woman having her own husband is an idiom for sexual intimacy. Have is a reference to sexual union. Remember two studies ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 that he says the sin that was present there that they were not taken care of, that a man has his father's wife. That's speaking of sexual union. Some translations render this idiom more clearly so we can see this meaning. One in particular of note is the NIV. I'm not a big fan of the NIV because there's trouble with some of the translations of some things that's very awkward and difficult and even contradictory. But right here, the NIV gets it spot on. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2 from the New International Version. But since sexual morality is occurring... Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Sexual desires are supposed to be fulfilled in marriage. God gave marriage as the proper place to fulfill our desires. Intimacy is not merely for bearing children, nor is intimacy some sort of necessary evil. Notice that both the man and the woman in marriage are to enjoy the pleasure of intimacy so that temptation will be warded off. Now, before we move on, and I know you're ready for me to move on, we need to make two observations here. First, polygamy is prohibited in this command. Each man is to have his own wife, singular, not wives. And each woman is to have her own husband, singular, not husbands. Second, homosexuality is prohibited. Paul does not say that each man is to have his own man or woman, or his own life partner. Paul does not say that each woman is to have her own man or woman or life partner. A man has a wife and a woman has a husband. Marriage is only between a man and a woman. And sexual intimacy in marriage is only between a husband and a wife. Verse 3, the Apostle Paul continues to say that the husband has the obligation to give to his wife what she desires in intimacy. Likewise, the wife is to give to the husband what he desires in intimacy. Notice again that Paul uses his words very carefully to not be so overt as to be inappropriate, but to be straightforward enough so as to be very clear in what he means. The language of verse 3 speaks literally of giving what is due or to give back that which is owed. So, in essence, we have a God-given responsibility to give ourselves to the sexual needs of our spouse to fight against temptation and because it is the right of marriage. It is part of our proper marital expectations. And he'll discuss that more in a moment. Intimacy is not a necessary evil and must not be perceived that way in any shape, form, or fashion within the confines of marriage. Now, verse 4 presses this thought even further. 
The wife has authority over her husband's body, and the husband has authority over his wife's body. Now, we understand this when we are getting married. When we are marrying, we are giving the right over our body to our spouse. This was a liberating teaching in a Roman world where men dominated women. In both the Greek and the Jewish cultures, the husband was in charge of his wife in all ways, including sexually. But the husband had few, if any, obligations to his wife unless it was to give her children. Now notice how Paul breaks this male-dominated idea. Both husband and wife are to give to each other. Now please notice very carefully, and I must stress, that this does not say that a man takes from his wife or that a woman takes from her husband. There is no taking in marriage. There is no demanding in marriage. There is no demeaning in marriage. Paul teaches us that there is supposed to be no selfishness in the physical aspects of marriage. Selfishness in marriage will destroy that marriage. And that should not be shocking at all for those of us who are Christians. The idea that you're giving yourself completely in marriage unselfishly. Now, before I move on with this, I do want to say a word or two about acceptable or unacceptable sexual practices between husbands and wives. This is a subject that's very hard to talk about in mixed company, in a, a Bible class setting, face to face. Right? It's very awkward. And, you know, it's, it's tough to get through. So hopefully this helps because this text shows us the general answer to those questions about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable in sexual practices within marriage. And the general answer is that there is nothing that is unacceptable within marriage. Paul's concern is that we are not giving ourselves enough in marriage to each other. We must understand that intimacy is critical in marriage because of temptation, because we have a right to each other, and we are to give ourselves to each other. But let me just explain just a little bit more so we can make sure that we are clear. This is not a free pass to go all carte blanche and do whatever you want to do without any thinking about what God expects from us. So having said that, there's nothing off the table regarding sexual intimacy between a husband and his wife. So, what does that mean? It means anything, husband and wife. You can't add a third partner, male or female, into that equation. Bringing in another person, even if agreed upon by both spouses, that both spouses are willing participants in this, that's still a sin. That's breaking the exclusive marriage covenant of one man and one woman. If it doesn't violate the word of God, then all intimacy within marriage is acceptable and fine. Here's the other difficult part about this. The spouse should want to fulfill the other spouse's needs and desires. But in the same way, love means that a spouse will not demand the other to do something that is not desired or is uncomfortable. Now, let me give you an illustration of that that's acceptable for all audiences so you can take that example and extrapolate that to all other areas of intimacy in marriage. So how about the old headache, right? That's something that's joked about in sitcoms and in, in telling of jokes and between husbands and wives. She says she has a headache that night. So what about the headache? The headache excuse, right? She has a headache that night. So look, I have a headache nothing's going to happen tonight. But in Paul's picture here, she wants to give herself to her husband anyway. But just as importantly, just as importantly in Paul's picture, the husband will not ask her because she's not feeling well. You see how that works? We don't want to cause our spouse to be uncomfortable or to be in pain we want to do what's best for them. As husbands, we love our spouses sacrificially. We don't want to take advantage of each other. We don't want to cause grief with each other. We want that intimacy to be enjoyable to both husband and wife. 
That's what marriage should look like. Both spouses wanting to fulfill each other's desires, while at the same time, each spouse not forcing each other into things that one does not desire. We are seeking mainly to please the other. She wants to please him and desires to give what he desires. He wants to please her and therefore desires not to demand of her what she finds unpleasant to give. In the same way, he wants to please her and desires to give her what she desires. She wants to please him and therefore desires to not demand of him what he finds unpleasant to give. All right, that's it. That's the illustration. I hope that helps. And I don't know how else to say that without getting more graphic, which I just am not going to do. Not, not going there. Okay, moving on. Verse 5, Paul says, hey, stop depriving each other. Don't do that. This word depriving is the same word used earlier in chapter 6. That's translated defaulting or cheating. You're cheating the other spouse or defrauding the other spouse when you withhold intimacy in marriage. You're robbing your spouse. Now, please notice the Apostle Paul can only conjure up one reason why there might be stopping of intimacy in marriage. He says, verse 5, perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So here's one reason why intimacy would be allowed to stop, and that's when you are devoting yourself to a time of prayer. But even this, he says, must be one, agreed to by both spouses, two, before a limited time, three, only for a spiritual need, not for punishment or anything like that, you know, sending them to the doghouse, and four, must result in coming back together in intimacy. So that why? Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Notice verse six, there's that word now. So this is connected to that last sentence here. Some translations, unfortunately, drop this connecting word out. So it's important for us to see that Paul says this and has given them a concession here, not a command. The point is that sexual intimacy must be constantly maintained in marriage, that we do not deprive each other out of anger or spite or out of a fight. And I think this is an important application that we need to make from this section. Separation in marriage is a sin. I have heard and seen Christians who know that divorce is condemned they decide, well, we'll just separate, but remain legally married. They no longer live together and pretty much doing nothing together. They act divorced, but they remain legally married. They are separated. And I want you to see that this is not an option. This is also a sin. Paul condemns anyone who thinks that separation is acceptable. You have not done something better by not divorcing. You're just committing a different sin. Don't deprive each other. Give yourself to each other and recognize the problem of sexual morality and the fight that both husbands and wives have in order to maintain their purity. This is why Paul ends this question in verse 7 with these words. He wishes that they were all like him. Now, some scholars suggest that Paul is saying that he wishes that all people were single like him. The New Living Translation even reads this way. But I wish everyone were single just as I am. But Paul says that everyone has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So is Paul saying that he wishes that no one was married? I don't think so. First, if this were the case, it would, it would be the end of human existence since children are to only come through marriage. Secondly, God is the one who instituted marriage. It was not an afterthought or a concession. And third, when the creation was completed, there was only one thing that was not good. Genesis 2, verse 18. What was it? It was not good for man to be alone. And finally, how can Paul say that he wishes everyone were single when this paragraph he's been praising the blessings of marriage? He has proclaimed to all the benefits of marriage. He's not denigrated marriage in any kind of way. What makes more sense? is for the Apostle Paul to be saying that he wishes everyone was free from the need of sexual fulfillment like him. This would be a gift from God to not be tempted to sexual sin. Now, some have this gift. Some people do not want to be married and they don't have strong sexual desires that need to be fulfilled. But that is not everyone. And Paul recognizes that this is a gift, not a requirement.
Now, in the next few verses here, the Apostle Paul addresses the unmarried and the married and gives directions for how they must live. So, here in verse 8, Paul begins by addressing the unmarried and the widows. Now, immediately there are frequent questions and controversies about who is being addressed, who belongs in the unmarried category. The addition of the word widows here to this group helps us understand who is in view. If the Apostle Paul had only said to the unmarried, we would be compelled to understand Paul referring to any person who is single. But because the Apostle Paul says, and the widows, we are compelled to consider who the unmarried are. The unmarried must refer to people who have never been married. If Paul meant all people who are single, then saying widows is just redundant. Rather, Paul has in mind those who have never been married and also those who have lost their spouse because of death. To say this another way, the Apostle Paul is referring to people who have a right to marriage. Now, what about those who are divorced? Well, he'll talk about them later, but that's not who he's addressing right here. Paul instructs the unmarried and the widows to remain as he is. Here is where the Apostle Paul has the idea of being single. Right? He didn't earlier, but now he says, it'd be better if you remain single. Now, is Paul saying that it's better to live a single life over getting married? Well, no, that's, that's not it at all. That would contradict how the rest of Scripture describes the blessings and benefits of marriage. We have to think about the context of what Paul is dealing with here. He's dealing with issues and questions that are coming from the Corinthian church. Now, unfortunately, we don't have their questions before us. That's not provided here. But we are able to assume some of the questions and the issues that the Corinthians had by examining how Paul responds. Verse 8 gives us some sense that there is a question about living a single life. There's a question about living single and being acceptable before God. We must remember that we're not dealing with societies that live the single life, but we're encouraged and recommended to marry. This was even stronger in the Jewish culture where rabbis were expected to be married. Again, we are reading counter-cultural teachings to the first century. Paul declares that it is good to be single as he is. It's acceptable before God. In fact, it is morally good before God. There's nothing wrong with living the single life. Now, we should emphasize this point because our culture has had a long track record of this kind of thinking, especially in the church. There's nothing wrong with somebody who is not married. Single people, particularly single Christians, do not need to be asked repeatedly when they are going to get married. They don't have to be married. It's good that they are not married. They can live full, acceptable, God-pleasing lives being single. And I believe that this is the point that the Apostle Paul is communicating to the Christians at Corinth who are under similar pressures and therefore have questions about remaining single. However, Paul makes something very, very clear. Being single means exercising self-control over your physical desires. This verse is a very important verse to show that sexual relations before marriage and outside of marriage is utterly condemned by God. The single life means the celibate life, according to the Lord. If you don't want to accept that life, then marriage is the only place where those desires are to be fulfilled. The word that he uses here to burn, to burn there at the end of verse 9, is better to marry than to burn with passion. It was a familiar and common metaphor for lust with widespread use, in fact, in Jewish and pagan cultures. And this is why all the translations add to burn with passion or sexual desires. Therefore, the Apostle Paul reminds them that marriage is the answer for those desires and one must not be overcome with their lusts and passions while trying to live the single life and lose their soul over it. Now, again, Paul's not saying that the purpose of marriage is to fulfill your desires. He is not saying if you can't control yourself, get married. That's not his point. His point is to remind what is at stake in living as a single. Being single means you must maintain sexual purity and exercise self-control. Marriage is the only lawful place for physical desires to be satisfied. Well, now, verse 10 and 11, Paul turns his attention to the married, and he gives directions of them. 
Now notice that what Paul says is he's teaching the very same thing that Jesus taught when he walked the earth. The charge that he is giving in these two verses is nothing new. In fact, remember from our study in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said the very same thing. Feel free to pause this video and to look up Matthew chapter 19 to refresh your memory. Okay, so notice that this is exactly what Paul declares in verse 10. The wife should not separate from her husband. Notice also verse 11, the husband should not divorce his wife. When we read Paul's command not to separate, don't think of this as legal separation that we have like today and the, the status that you can have today. In those societies, there was no such legal term for separation. Once you left, you were divorced. You could not be separated, but still married like you can today. Divorce and separate are the same meaning in the New Testament. Remember Matthew 19, verse 6? What God has joined together, let not man separate. We can even see secularly that writings outside of the Bible during this time also use the word separate to mean divorce. So what God is doing here through Paul's inspired pen is not following the culture or the laws of the land. He does not care what our laws say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The world needs to hear this teaching. Marriage is to be for life. Don't divorce. Enter into marriage as a covenant between yourself and your spouse that will not be broken as long as you live. In fact, you actually say those words and your vows to your spouse and before God when you get married. You say, till death do us part. That's a serious vow. And it's God's intentions for marriage. What we learn here is that we're not in a contract. A contract is like our cell phone service. They provide you service. And if you're happy with that service, you stay with them. But if you don't like what they are doing, then you move to another carrier and stay with them as long as we are happy. That's a contract. And today, many treat marriage as a contract. It's not a contract. It's a vow. Your marriage vows were not that you would love each other as long as the other person did certain things for you. You did not say that you will take out the trash as long as she does the dishes. She did not say that she would make dinner as long as you make a lot of money. You did not enter into contract. You entered into a covenant. You said you were staying in that marriage regardless of what the other person does. You said that in richer or poorer, for health or sickness, or for any other circumstances. Recently, I saw a woman post on social media that she had just left the courthouse from her divorce. She had divorced her husband. And she wanted to explain that her husband was the love of her life. He was in a car wreck a few years earlier and he was in a vegetative state. He wasn't on life support, so there was no plug that could be pulled. So his body was surviving on its own. And she exclaimed her husband would have wanted her to move on, to find someone to have a relationship with. And so she divorced him, and so she could move on with her life. Folks, that's not in sickness and in health till death do us part. How many stories have we heard about somebody who was in a vegetative state or in a coma that they were expected to never get out of it, and then one day they do, they come out of it? We have no idea. There are still so many mysteries about our brains that we still haven't discovered yet. And that's trying to find a loophole to get out of that situation. So regardless if you're living in a cardboard box, you're in this together. That is a marriage covenant. I mean, you think about it. That's what God modeled for us and the covenant he made with us. God loves us and is in this for our good, even when we are complete sinners. He made a covenant with us. We are in a covenant in marriage also. Now notice here he does address divorce. What do you do when you divorce? You reconcile or you remain unmarried. I don't believe here that Paul is in any kind of way trying to supersede what Jesus said about divorce and remarriage. Nor does Paul need to say, now, except for sexual morality, because that's already been covered. This is separation for any reason. I recognize the complications that can be created with trying to understand everything that's going on here. And that our lives are so vastly different, maybe, in some kinds of way, that it's hard for us to decide or to know what is the appropriate response. And I'm happy to speak to anyone privately 
about their marital condition to help know how to apply these marriage laws. I also recognize that the church isn't the marriage police. If someone tells me that they divorced their spouse because they had been cheating on them, I don't need to see the evidence or the proof of that. Well, you got to show me the proof so I can approve it. It's not my place to approve that. This is between you and the Lord. And I realize that as human beings, we can make some pretty complicated situations. And it's hard to know what to do to be right before the Lord. I want to help you with this in any way possible. So if you need help with trying to understand this, I would love to talk to you about that. Not so I can, you know, bless what you have done or in any kind of way or to admonish you in any kind of way, but so we can reason together and to help to understand how to apply the Word of God to your personal situation, your life situation. Now, as we think about that, we must never reject the teaching of our Lord, no matter how difficult the command may be. The Lord is the master who has saved us from our sins. We must submit to his marriage laws. He created marriage for us, and we are governed by those laws. Don't resist the Lord, but serve him and submit to him. Now, what about an unbelieving spouse? What if you marry an unbeliever? Once again, we're able to see the practical truth that God's marriage laws apply to all people for all time under all covenants. The two have become one flesh. Even though they were both unbelievers and now one has come to Christ, God has joined them together and they are not to separate. Now, Paul must explain why this is the case in their circumstance. Isn't this wrong that they are married to an unbeliever? Isn't this a sin because they don't have a Christian spouse? Paul explains in verse 14. Paul states that the unbelieving spouse is made holy because of the Christian spouse. Now we understand that the Apostle Paul cannot be saying that the unbelieving spouse is saved because they're married to a Christian. Paul does not say the spouse is saved. In fact, in verse 16, Paul was offering the possibility that the unbelieving spouse may eventually be saved. But the unbelieving spouse is not saved because of the marriage. Holiness did not mean salvation in the Old Testament. The point Paul is making is that the purity of the marriage is not contaminated by the unbelieving spouse. The spouse is not defiled. The spouse is not to be considered contaminated or unclean. The relationship is not impure. Paul proves this point by saying that this kind of thinking would mean that your children were unclean as well, but they're not unclean. They're not defiled. The simple point is that there is nothing sinful about this relationship. Stay in the marriage. Don't divorce, even if your spouse is not a Christian. So what about what Paul says in verse 15? But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. What, is, what does he mean there? Well, got to stay within the context. Our context has helped us to see that we have a situation where the spouse will not stay with you because of your faith. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do is let the spouse leave. We're not called upon for, to forfeit our faith in Jesus to preserve the marriage. Based on the language that Paul is using here, he's saying, let the unbeliever leave because the brother or sister was not enslaved in the past and continues to not be enslaved. And that confirms that Paul cannot be talking about the marriage bond here. He can't be saying that you let the unbeliever depart because you're not married and you are still not married. What could Paul say about this relationship that the believer was not enslaved in the past to the unbeliever and continues to not be enslaved? What does that mean? The Christian was not enslaved to forfeit their faith in the past, and they continue to not be enslaved to forfeit their faith now. Just like the laws of the land... We are commanded to obey them. But we're not enslaved to obey the laws of the land when they cause us to disobey God. We are not to be enslaved in that kind of way to our government. We obey the government as long as it doesn't disobey God's law. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were faithful to the law of the land until they were told they had to bow down to the idol. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. We'll obey all the other laws of the land. We'll be good citizens, but that we cannot do because we only serve our God. We only bow down to our God. In the same way, these Christians have unbelieving spouses who are leaving because they are Christians. Paul says, let them leave. 
because you're not enslaved to disobey God in order to remain in that marriage. But God called you to peace, he says at the end of verse 15. So don't cause unnecessary strife. Christians must not be initiating divorces from unbelievers. In verse 16, Paul continues to explain why the Christian should remain in the marriage. You don't know whether you will save your husband or wife. You don't know if they may come to the faith. So, have peace in your marriage relationship. Now, some will say, some will take verse 17 as a page break, uh, a new paragraph, so he's done talking about married to unbelievers. But notice, Paul does not change his audience here. Paul is very clear in the paragraph when he changes the group he is speaking to. Notice here, let's go back. Verse 8, who's he talking to? He says, to the unmarried and the widows. And then down in verse 10, to the married. And verse 12, to the rest, I say. Notice verse 17, he hasn't changed audiences here. He's not offering a new teaching or a new group. The next group doesn't appear until we get down to verse 25. And notice what he says there, now concerning the betrothed. So verse 17, Paul it writes these Christians to remain in the condition they were called, and he's talking to those who are married to unbelievers. They were not to change their marriage condition because they have come to Christ and are married to unbelievers. And the Apostle Paul uses two illustrations to prove the need to stay in the marriage to an unbeliever. So starting verse 18 here down to verse 20, if you were circumcised when you came to Christ, then you remain circumcised and don't try to remove those marks. If you're uncircumcised, you're not to seek circumcision. Being circumcised or uncircumcised does not matter. In the same way, a Christian married to an unbeliever is not an issue. And a Christian was not charged with changing that condition. Now, the second illustration he gives here in verse 21 down through verse 24 is that of slavery. If you were a slave when you came to Christ, don't be concerned about that. You can be a slave and be a Christian. If you were free when you came to Christ, you can be free and be a Christian. Paul says that these things don't matter for the earthly slave is free in Christ. And the free person on earth is a slave to the Lord. We belong to the Lord, regardless of our physical condition or situation. Therefore, verse 29, remain with God in the condition you were in when you were called to Christ. The point is, again, the Christian is not to divorce the unbeliever, but remain in that marriage. This is the context of the paragraph. To insert any other marital situation is to insert something that Paul did not have in mind. So what does all this mean in a practical kind of way for us today? Well, if you are a Christian and your spouse is not a Christian, you cannot cave into the wishes of your spouse to not go to services, to not come and serve the Lord. If they are in any way trying to prevent you from coming to worship, you have to go anyway. I knew of a couple years ago who she and her children would go to church and the husband would not. And he tried and tried and tried to keep her from going to church. He even went as far as to remove the spark plugs from the truck to keep her from driving her kids to church. Only well, when she realized the truck wouldn't start, she got the kids, gathered them in her arms, and started walking down the highway. Seeing her walk down the highway and being determined to go and serve the Lord no matter what he does, he put the spark plugs back in, drove down the road to meet her, and said, please get in the truck. I'll take you and the kids to church. It was not long after that that he obeyed the gospel. Years later, when he was old and gray and his wife was suffering from Alzheimer's, he was still going to church, still serving the Lord. He was a rock for that congregation. He taught Bible classes. He led singing. He preached. He did whatever was necessary, even responding to a letter from a young man who was seeking to preach. And he invited him to come. And so I began preaching for the first congregation that I ever preached for on a first-time basis. And for three years, it was a wonderful time to be able to learn and to grow in the Word of God with Brother Scroggins. I'll never forget the time I spent with him, learning to preach the Word of God. I'll never forget their long suffering as I was trying to work through how to, how to do this. Brother Scroggins has since gone on to his reward. I'm grateful for what he did and for the work that he accomplished, all because his wife refused to compromise regarding serving the Lord. She was going to serve the Lord anyway.
and the Apostle Paul was right. He obeyed the gospel. So, if your spouse does not want you to attend services or doesn't seem like they're ever going to attend services, they're never going to obey the gospel, never know how your faith in the Lord can trump all things that are going on in life and that that spouse can be won over even without a word, but just by your example alone. So please be encouraged to continue to serve the Lord faithfully, even when your spouse is not being faithful to the Lord. As you can see, the Apostle Paul has much to say about marriage. And in fact, we just don't have time to go over everything. This video would be two hours long. Uh, but just understand the basic points here that the Apostle Paul is making. You can live a single life and be pleasing to the Lord. But understand, this means you will exercise self-control and remain sexually pure. Number two, sexual relations is right and a blessing of marriage that is not to be withheld. Number three, marriage is for life. A person is not to divorce your spouse. Divorce is a sin. Marriage is a covenant that is not to be broken. Number four, if you do divorce, you must remain unmarried or be reconciled to your former spouse. Again, the exception to this, according to Jesus in Matthew 5 and in Matthew 19, is if your spouse has committed sexual morality. Only then can you remarry. Number five, if you remarry and the cause of that divorce was not sexual morality, you are now committing adultery. For the adultery to stop, one must sever the sinful marriage and apply Paul's teaching here from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and remain unmarried or be reconciled to your first spouse. Number six, if you're married to an unbeliever, you are to remain in the marriage. Number seven, if an unbeliever divorces the Christian for being a Christian, then you must remain unmarried or be reconciled. There is no authorization for marriage. And finally, number eight, if your spouse dies, you have the right to remarry but you are still required to follow all of God's marriage laws. I hope that this has helped. There is, again, there's so much here that if there's something I didn't cover, because there's a lot I didn't cover, but you want to know more about, please feel free to comment on this video or send me a message. Let me know, and I'll be happy to discuss that further. Let me say this in conclusion. If you're experiencing problems in your marital relationship, don't wait until your marriage is irretrievably broken get help. Seek the counsel of a qualified elder, preacher, or marriage counselor who can advise you based on biblical principles. In fact, recently we had Wilson Adams here for a gospel meeting. His wife, Julie, is a licensed family and marriage counselor. She does meet with clients online, and I'll post her information in the description of this video. Thanks so much. I hope this has been helpful to you. Next time, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Have a great and wonderful day. When my love...